guys. So before the modern advent of mechanized fabric creation, people made fabrics and garments and things using machines like looms, but also they would do it by hand. And making fabric by hand uh, was, you sort of think of knitting and crocheting, but they're actually quite modern inventions in the scheme of history. And if you go way, way back, you find a thing called, um, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation here, but it's nail bunding. Nail bunding was a um, well, it's nail binding, if you're, <laughs> if you're Australian, <laughs> is actually the process of making fabric with your hands, with special needles. And nail binding needles are kind of have a lot of similarities to modern sewing needles, where there's an eye and a point. But you'll notice that they're much larger and a little bit oddly shaped. There's sort of a spade end to them rather than a point. So they come in different sizes and materials. This one here is a wooden one that's quite large. This was a sort of a mid-sized one made of antler. Uh, and sometimes, if they had the money for it, they'd make little ones out of iron. And this one's just mild steel. Uh, it was actually made from a horseshoe nail. But the size of the needle actually is dictated by the size of the wool or thread that's being used. And sometimes the small one would be taken to a garment made of larger wool, and this would be used to actually weave patterns into the fabric. So this whole collection of tools could be bundled up and put into traditionally a little uh, bone flask that could actually be worn on a belt or thrown in a pack. You would have everything that you need to work with whatever fibers that you have available to make garments or uh, other fabrics or the bags and pouches and things like that that you may need as you travel. And so the art of nail bunding has not been lost. It's still quite very much alive thanks to the reenactment community. But what I wanted to do is actually do a sort of a collab video with my wife who is very handy with wool and you should absolutely follow her on Instagram Nissa Handcrafts I'll put her tag down there but she knows wool better than anybody I know and so when I made these I thought let's have a look and see what she can do with them after a couple of comments after sharing having made these on my Instagram because um, I'd made these because Nissa had expressed interest in wanting to actually learn this sort of oblique craft and I thought we'd do a collab where I show you how to make a null bunding set or just one needle and you can scale it up or down as you need and then she'll show you actually how to get started in learning to do it yourself. So for my first collab with my wife let's have a look at what is possible. So you can see here we have three different sizes. The key factors here uh, that if you're going to use any material, it has to have the capacity to be really smooth, glass smooth. So not all timbers are going to work, but most hardwoods you can actually sand up to quite a slick finish. Uh, this is mountain ash, Tasmanian mountain ash. This is antler from a deer. And of course, iron, or in our case, mild steel. But it doesn't need to be hardened. That's the, the key thing. So it, historically, uh, they would have used bog iron or wrought iron to, to make these. Weren't often found as steel or, or iron. Mostly it was made from uh, bone or antler or wood. Wood is less durable but more suitable for larger, um, larger knits. Now, uh, null bunding is interesting compared to something like uh, knitting or crochet, it actually offers several advantages. Um, one of them is that it is uh, actually the fabric that it produces is stretchy. It's a stretch fabric, which is normally dictated by the material uh, in something like crochet. Uh, however, in 
um, nail bonding, it's actually dictated by the stitch that happens with the needles. It's an incredibly complex stitch compared to something like crochet or knitting, um, but it creates this beautiful stretchy fiber that's perfect for things like socks and mittens and jumpers and beanies and all sorts of things like that. The other thing is because of that stitch complexity, if you get a hole in it, it will not unravel. It's, it's almost impossible to unravel even if you wanted to unravel it and try it. You just can't do it. So it makes incredibly durable garments compared to something like crochet or knitting. Crochet unravels a lot less readily. But it does fray and, and sort of split open. Nail binding doesn't. Um, and the final thing is, it's actually something that can be done with short lengths at a time of fiber, which sort of is uh, representative of the history of the time. You couldn't just go to a shop necessarily and buy a ball of wool. I mean, that was still a thing, but it was harder to find. You couldn't just have your nearby craft store because they were a bit further spaced apart. So you sort of had to work with the fibers that you had, or even as it was being spun. Whereas nail bunding, you actually are working with about two meters at a time, uh, or two yards at a time. And that's about all. You can work with longer lengths uh, with larger eyes on your needles. However, we'll get into that when we talk about using them. So let's have a talk about a nail bunding needle. And this is the needle. And you'll notice there are several um, little features to it. Now they're pointed at both ends. That's not super necessary, but you want the eye end, that's the eye, you want the eye end to slope off. You want the pointy end to slope off and that's absolutely necessary. They don't need to slope off the same amount because you're only ever pushing the needle through this way in order to achieve the stitch and so the slope here basically helps the, it slip through a bit like a, a pass through drift in forging. The eye is going to be the size at least the size of the thread that you, the needle is designed for and is usually just over one third the total width. This um, needle size will determine the width of the thread that is used. The thread that you're going to use uh, with this needle is, or any needle is going to be roughly one third the width. You notice that it is narrow this way and wide this way. This narrowness is usually the thickness of the hole or the thread that you're going to be using. So that will be two or three times as wide and you kind of want it to follow the rule of about a third about a third. You can see this eye, particular eye, is a little bit larger than a third and that's the sort of thresholds that you've got to work with. Um, the walls of the eye here are going to be thicker or thinner um, based on the sturdiness of the material really. If you want to make it easier to thread you can make a larger eye. Um, you'll see this one here has quite thin walls because it's steel and it can. If I tried to make walls that thin on the wooden one, it would just fall apart. Even antler is brittle enough to cause problems. So you may have also noticed that the eye is in different positions on different ones. And usually the larger the needle, the further down the eye is, but it's never further in than about a, a quarter to a third of the, the width. It just uh, allows for better pass-throughs. It's not necessary. Even on a one this big, you could still have it at the end, so long as all these shapes are in place. Uh, you'll notice that the front is not a sharp point. It's more of a spatula sort of point. Narrow this way, kind of wide this way. This will actually help you pry up, because you actually have to use it if you've got a layer of wool to slide under and lift to push through. This happens a lot, so stick with more of a spatula end. Even this tiny steel one, narrower this way than it is this way. So the final point of interest here is this channel here. Now this is not always found on historical examples. And it's something that actually makes it easier to use. Because when you have your thread running through it, it gives a channel for the thread to sit in and means that there is not a lump sticking out actually sort of temporarily thickening the uh, the width, because if you're passing it through here and it gets to the eye and there's wool sticking out here and here, it's going to make it that you've got to really push through and that's going to widen your stitches. Having a channel there allows the wool to sit in it and allows it to slip through a lot easier, allowing you to keep nice tight stitches and make very beautiful looking fabric. So um, you'll notice that that channel 
is present on any of them, even right down to the little ones. And you can actually see this evidenced in modern sewing needles as well. It's just a practical thing. So keep that in mind. That channel is not often found in historical examples simply because it's harder to put in there if you are working without power tools or any sort of modern conveniences like sandpaper. So trying to do it without those is a little trickier and more time consuming. These were often made on the road literally using rocks as abrasives. This it can be done like that. Uh, whittling and abrasive rocks can make one of these in the wild, so to speak. So having nice bone ones obviously last a lot longer. They would have cost more money, taken more time to produce. Um, but yeah, you, you can make them out of wood if you're willing to make it smooth enough that the wool does not catch on it as it slides around it. And therein lies the trickiness if you're not used to working on it. But we're going to actually go through that entire process in this video to show you how to do it. So with the preamble out of the way, let's go over to the workshop and make a null bonding needle. So the first thing you're going to want to do is prep a bit of wood. Now, if you're going to be using antler or wood or metal, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you start with a billet. And the billet needs to be this pretty much as close as you can the same thickness the entire length the width is going to depend on the size cord that you're looking to use now i'll show you what i'm using it is 13 millimeters wide five millimeters thick 125 millimeters long what that is imperial i will put down the bottom so if you start with this if you are having trouble actually producing a billet of raw material that is kind of shaped like this then maybe making sewing needles is not for you so we'll continue on from here so the first step that you want to do is establish which end is going to be your um, tip and which end is going to be your eye so i'll draw the eye in first and i want the eye to be somewhere up near this end. It doesn't need to be any particular spot, but I'm not going to use the uh, entire length of this. I might actually shorten it down to about that long. I'll take, I took about an inch and then a quarter off the end there. Look at me switching between metric and imperial. <laughs> so we want our eye to be about here. Now, you'll notice the eye is elongated. See that? And the reason the eye is elongated is because it makes it, the needle more versatile. Normally on a sewing needle, you would just put one bit of thread through and hold it like this. Whereas on uh, when you're doing nail bunding, you're actually uh, able to loop through multiple times in order to hold more um, of your thread. So we'll get into that when we actually show the how-to part of the video. But once we've got these two things established, we can now uh, start actually marking out how things go. Now, the fattest part of the nail binding needle should be where the eye is. And you want it to taper off just a little bit towards the end. Once again, it doesn't have to be precise. Just taper off like that. And you want a longer taper down at the pointy end but it doesn't come to a point so you're not going to have the the taper meet in the middle like this you want it to be about be half the width of the total thing maybe a little bit less and you want that to be a graceful taper like so Now you'll notice these aren't really straight lines as much, kind of like a straight line like that. They're sort of a little bit curvy. That's fine. They could be straight or curvy. It'll still work. Uh, I find curvy a little bit more aesthetically pleasing and comfortable in the hand. But that is now the sort of silhouette shape of our needle. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to drill a hole here, drill a hole here, and drill a hole here in the middle. 
to sort of rough out that slotted eye. So I'll drill those holes, then I'll be back. And there we are, holes drilled in there. So now we need to actually get rid of those. Let's bring this up here, focus you in. So these jaggedy, jaggedy edges, and get rid of those and make that entire thing a nice smooth sided round ended even looking slot now you can do this with needle files you could even do this with a whittling knife if you're careful i'm going to be using my rotary tool and um, so sort of just grinding away those sides until it's smooth and ovular so still this is more or less a third the width like we discussed earlier. If you want to make it a little bit bigger, that's fine. That, that will work. But only make it a little bit bigger. And then we can move on to the next step. And there we go. Pretty easy, really. Doesn't take much, especially when you're using wood. On metal or, or bone, it can be a little trickier. But on wood, that is pretty good. Now, I should say, I'm using a good hard wood here. Now, when I say hard wood, I don't mean hardwood. Because balsa wood is a hard wood. <laughs> I mean hard wood. This is ash. Curly ash. Um, and ash is very hard. But very uh, sort of supple as well. So very good for this sort of thing. I, I would recommend ash if you are just struggling to pick a particular wood. Now that we have that in there. You see it's not perfect. It's not perfectly even. But it doesn't have to be. Uh, it's, it's the beauty of this. There's not much precision is required in these things. But now that we've got this, we're going to cut out this silhouette uh, from the piece of wood that we drew in here. So we'll get rid of this excess, get rid of these sides, get rid of these. I'm going to be using a scroll saw and then neatening it up on a belt sander. But you can use a whittling knife. You could use even files and rasps to do this. Or just rub it on some rock or concrete and it will wear away. And there we go, through the magic of video editing, <laughs> our silhouette is done. But it's still very square and blocky. So the first thing you want to do is get rid of any of these corners. Round them over. Not big round, not sort of a lot of rounding, but just a little bit. Just enough to take the harshness out of those corners. Uh, once again, you can use a file, if it's like a nice second cut file. Or you can use sandpaper even. 120 grit sandpaper will do a great job. Um, or if you've got a belt grinder like me, that's the next step. So quickly do that and I'll show you what it looks like. And just like that, those harsh corners are gone. Now that you've got those, we need to start working this axis down. So we've done this one, we need to start work on this one. Now this one's where things get a little tricky. But we want there to be a thinning down to this end, quite thin. So here it's nice and wide, but here it's nice and thin. And this end, not quite as thin, but thinning down. But once again, the fattest part is going to be where the eye is. Like that. So... We're going to sand this down so that it thins up to there, then up to there, and then here it's going to be that long, graceful taper again, up towards there, and up towards there. Make sense? So we end up with like a cigar sort of shape. Once again, files, stones, whatever you've got will work. I'm going to be using a belt grinder just because it's easiest. And it only takes a very short while to do it, if you know what you're doing. So we'll get that sorted out, and I'll show you what that looks like. And bada bing bada boom, we have here this profile this way. This profile this way, I'll show it without the markings. See that? Fattest where the eye comes up to the eye there. We could probably thin out this a little bit more, but it doesn't really matter at this point. 
is the next stage is going to be to round off all of these corners so the entire thing is smooth. Now, if you have a stable enough hands, you can do that on a grinder. I like to sort of start the process with a bit of a chamfer on the grinder, going in at sort of like 45 degrees, uh, knock the corners off first, and then take it to 120 grit sandpaper to finish the shaping rubbing the whole thing down so the entire thing is round and smooth and there's no harsh corners anywhere on the piece except for the inside of that eye. So you're going to do that until the entire thing is smooth. So we'll do that and I'll be back. And there you have it. Nice and smooth. This is 120 grit. And now that it's smooth you can kind of see the inconsistency of the eye there. But I'll show you why that doesn't matter um, very very soon. So you can see there's no harsh corners left except on the inside of the eye. The tip is nice and thin this way and wide this way. And it's thinned down here, but stubbier version of that up near the eye of the needle. You now want to sand this whole thing up to a very fine grit. Keep progressing up through the grits. I like to go all the way up to 1200 grit because any slight burr or splinter on this will catch wool so fast and the smoother this is the better so ideally you want to go all the way up to about a 1200 grit and then buff it if you can buff it uh, after 1200 grit it will be so smooth it will feel like glass so that's going to be the next step it is time consuming but it's worth it here we go buffed and smooth and glossy that's what you want to see now rely on your sense of touch here don't don't rely on your sense of sight. If you feel any catching spots that you think might be able to catch a bit of wool, uh, and try to test it. If you've got some wool, which you should have if you're going to be making one of these, um, rub wool over it and see if it catches anywhere, because you want there to be no catching points. See how this has still not been sharpened. It is still blunt and spatula-like. That's what you want. You don't want this to get too sharp, otherwise it'll start splitting the fibers of the wool. So now we need to work on the eye. Now the trickiest part about this is that the entire inside um, corner, that whole thing needs to be rounded off and smooth because currently that is a harsh corner. Now you can do this with needle files, you can do this with burrs on a rotary tool, or if you don't have any fancy tooling, you can do it with sandpaper, but you've got to get in there and smooth out that entire inside corner there and there and sand and smooth the inside walls of the eye to match the smoothness of this. This is a fiddly process and possibly the fiddliest part of making one of these needles, uh, but take your time with it. Don't put too much pressure on, so you might avoid breaking these walls. But uh, you've got to get that eye looking nice and smooth. So here we go. Bring that focus in. See how that's not a harsh corner anymore. It's nice and round. And that's what you want to see. So now the final stage in shaping this needle is actually optional. Now, like I said earlier, not found on many historical examples, but... From the perspective of my wife, who's actually very familiar with wool and how to work it, uh, she assures me this helps a lot. And that is to have a groove running from the back of the eye to the stubby end on both sides. Something for the wool to actually sit down into. Now, you obviously don't want to go down so deep that you grind through uh, and leave a channel. That would be bad, but you want to actually have a trench that is deep enough that the wall can actually, uh, when viewing it from here, the wall can go in here through the eye and then lay in that trench without adding too much extra thickness to the needle. So um, just a little bit deep, probably come in a third of the way in from both sides and gouge a trench. You can do this with needle files, like a round needle file. You can do this with sandpaper wrapped around a drill bit. Um, or you can use a ball burr on a rotary tool and not only cut the, those trenches in nice and straight leading from the eye right off the back 
uh, but sand it all smooth and round over the edges here to make sure that it's smooth. So we'll do that and then see what that looks like. And here we go. Let's have a, get some focus. There we go. You can see that channel. If you look right down the barrel, you can see it forms like an eye beam shape running right down to the eye. And that corner in there is rounded over on both sides, so it's nice and smooth. Made sure there wasn't a ridge in the bottom there that might catch things. It's just a nice, smooth channel. And with a coat of oil, that's now ready to put to use. Now, like I said, it can be made in all different sizes. Um, the materials, uh, you can make them out of brass or copper even. You could make them out of uh, antler or bone, make them out of wood. So long as it is a hard material with no give in it, you'll be fine. In terms of usefulness, it is a personal preference whether or not this curves up like this. Instead of being a straight line down, sometimes towards the, the pointiest end, they'll curve up. The amount of curve, or if there is curve there at all, is a personal preference to the user. However, after talking to my wife, going through using them uh, and making things with them, the smaller they are, the more handy that curve becomes. But, once again, it's a personal preference for you. So, as you're making them, you'll find that you might want a bit of a curve. Well, try making one with a curve and then using it and see what you think. You might find that you prefer the curve there. But, as you've seen from the making process, there's not much precision required in these things. They're not really a high-detail tool. As I said, they can be made on the road with basically just using abrasive rocks or whittling tools. They're very simple and easy to make and you can actually make full garments out of it, which is quite incredible when you think about it. So this one here is um, probably above a medium size. A medium size would probably be about seven or eight centimeters long. This one is, yeah, this one's nine and a half centimeters long, so it's a little bit bigger. Um, seven centimeters is a good starting size, unless you're feeling particularly clumsy, then a bigger one is better. Um, largest ones that I've seen uh, upwards of 12, 13 centimeters long. So, yeah, it, it all comes down to the size of stitch that you want to actually use it for. But I'm going to put a coat of oil on this just to seal that wood. And then I'll take you over to my wife, Nissa, and she's going to show you how to make use of them. Cigarette, a thunderstorm to keep 